Hello and welcome to the seventh video in a series of game development tutorials on how to make your own scary survival horror game in Unity. In this tutorial we'll be covering some c -sharp programming to trigger those cubes or boxes to fall whenever we get close. Remember to subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with every tutorial I upload. Feel free to leave a comment or drop a like. I also have a Patreon page where you can help be a part of this channel, and you'll also find all the scripts and assets that we use in this series there too, along with plenty of other things. You can also join as a free member. And now, on with the tutorial. So let's get to work with some C Sharp programming. Now we already have dabbled ever so slightly with some programming previously when we imported our player capsule, because it has these scripts here. But we need to actually create scripts from scratch now. We need to be able to do something. And what we're going to do is we are going to make it so as when we get close, we want something to happen with these particular cubes. So before we do that, let's actually get these cubes or boxes, because we will texture them at some point. Let's get them into place so as they kind of maybe fall when we ever get close. So first things first, I'm going to take the cubes and just kind of place them somewhat relevant to where the bed is. Yeah, somewhere around there, to be honest. In fact, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to make this a little bit easier. I'm not going to have all these cubes floating everywhere. I'm going to make it so as I can duplicate them one by one in the correct position. But let's just quickly check where this cube falls first. Hopefully it doesn't look too silly. It should be OK, I think once we wait for Unity. Okay, yeah, so that looks okay there. Let's bring it down one more. Right, so I'm going to duplicate that, move it along, duplicate that, move it along, duplicate that, and move it along. Uh, I'm gonna put a few more up top, probably about there, about there, and maybe one just kind of bounce in there. And if we press play, let's just make sure the physics on these don't send them a bit wonky too early on. It might do, but I'm not too sure. Right, okay, so not too happy with how that has kind of gone like that, but I guess it doesn't really matter. Because the idea is that these are going to fall off the bed. So we now need to move them to a a little bit further off. So as if I move them to about there, I would assume that if we press play they will tumble forwards, and we need to stop that from actually happening. But you'll see just how all of this comes together when we use a script anyway. There we go, see? They've just kind of fallen on the floor. So in order to prevent that, what we're going to do is we're going to have a secret hidden cube to prevent them from falling. So this middle cube here, I'm going to hold Control, press D to duplicate, and then I'm going to go down and I'm going to remove the rigid body. So right click, remove component, and then drag this down so the boxes hover over it. And let's expand the scale just a, a little more across. So it's going to be probably four. And then place it a little there so as all these boxes are now hovering on top of this. And just untick Mesh Renderer. Now what this means when we press play is they will give the illusion that they are indeed sat on the bed. But they are not. They are actually on something that we're going to remove. So these boxes now will not fall. So in preparation for them to fall as we get closer, let's move our player capsule a little further away. And now let's create that script that will allow us to trigger that. So in our assets folder down here, let's right click, create, folder. And let's call this scripts. And I'm going to create a script in here, and I'm just going to call it box scare. So it's important to know what we name our script. So if we go into that script in Visual Studio by hitting return, we now need to ensure that the class name is the same as the script name. But I'll explain a little more as we get further into this script when it's loaded. So by default, it will present to you several lines of code, and you can see them here. Let's go through what some of these are. This up here is known as the namespace. So all this using system.collections, using systems.collections.generic, and using Unity Engine is a namespace. 
What is a namespace? Quite simply, you can think of it as a library for the script to know what it's doing. For example, the script wants to do something in Unity, but it doesn't know what to do, so it goes to the namespace to find the correct thing. It's the same formula as you wanting to know something, so you go to the library to find a book. Think So you can think of it as the library for the script. Next we have the public class, and the class is where most of the coding takes place. In this case you can see box scare is the same as what we named it, so the class name and the script name have to be the same, otherwise you may end up with errors and the script will not work correctly. What is the class exactly? Well, it is where all of our methods and our variables and anything we really code is contained. And what is a method and what is a variable? Well, we'll get around to variable a little later on, but at the moment you can see these two methods, void, dot, void, update. These two are known as methods, and you can see here above it, these green lines, they are not lines of code. Anything that has two slashes in front is a way of making a note on the script. So it's never executed as a line of code, it is simply just a note. So what are these methods exactly? What do they do? Well, contained in a method is the basically the meat of the script. It's what actually functions, it's what the script does. So if we were to have a method that says, you know, turn off this object, turn this sound effect on, turn this light off, that would all be inside a method. So you can think of the method as the container for the instructions that the script has to do. So how do we make it so as this script turns that imaginary see-through object off and the boxes fall? Well, that's actually really, really simple. The method we need to use is called on trigger enter. And we don't need start and we don't need update. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to delete those two methods. So let's select all of that and hit return. Let's go up here just beneath this close curly bracket and let's first declare a variable. What is a variable? It can be a reference to anything, whether it be a number, a sound, a game object, a, te a text, anything. So in this case, the variable we want to use is going to be that see-through imaginary cube that's balancing those box cubes on. So to declare a variable, we type public, and because it's a game object, we say game object, and we can call this anything we want, as long as it's relevant, I guess. Uh, so let's call it box holder with a semicolon. What's the semicolon for? It basically just tells the script that this is the end of the line, proceed to the next line. So we've got our variable declared. How do we make it so as we can control this variable in a method? Easy. All we need to type is void and then on, trigger, enter, and make sure it is a capital O, capital T, capital E. Capitalization is vital when it comes to programming. For example, game object has capital G and a capital O in our variable. If it was a lowercase g, that would be something different and the script wouldn't work. So just be mindful whenever you're doing things like this that capitalization is important. So once we've typed on trigger enter, open bracket, and it will automatically put in private void on trigger enter collide other in the parentheses. It doesn't need to be a private, so we can remove private. And the next bit of line goes inside this bit of code. And it's going to be really, really simple. The idea of what we're going to do is whenever we enter a certain area of our game, we want to be able to turn off box holder. And that effectively gives the illusion that we've got close to it, so the boxes are going to fall. And it is just one simple line of code that does this. All we need to say is box holder dot. Now you'll see at this point, it's grayed out, but it's predicting what we actually want to do. Not all versions of Visual Studio will do this. However, if you're using something fairly recent, it will do. It will predict what you're trying to do. And in this case, it has got it correct. So if we tap tab and tab again, it will fill out the line for us. Sometimes the prediction will be correct, other times it won't be. So just be mindful. But the correct line of code that we want to have here is indeed boxholder.setActive and in brackets, 
false with a semicolon at the end. And just make sure that that is in between these two curly brackets. And what this line will do is it will turn off the object that we define as box holder. How do we define box holder? Well, that's where the next bit comes in. Let's save our script. And then let's head back into Unity. Give it a second just to compile. You can see it's taking a moment there. Sometimes Unity does this. It's a little bit slow when uh, compiling things together, but be patient with it and it'll do it. So back into Unity. What we need to do now is attach this script to our scene and make it so as it is actually functional. Now to do that, we can use a cube again. So if we go to game object, 3D object, cube, and now we need to place this cube where we want the trigger to be. So you can think of this cube as literally the trigger to the jump scare. So I'm going to have it somewhere probably there. And I'm going to expand it so as it covers all the way across. So we trigger this jump scare no matter what we do. So I'm going to hover over the X and just scale it lengthways, like so. And I'm going to turn off Mesh Renderer. I'm going to rename Cube to box trigger. And then I'm going to attach the box scare script that we just wrote onto box trigger. And if you scroll down here, you'll see that's where our variable is. So this is how we can define that variable so as the script knows what object to turn off. If, for example, we put wall in there, it would end up just turning the wall off and you wouldn't see the wall anymore when we trigger it. But we don't want that. We want that cube, which is somewhere there. So I'm going to rename that cube and call it box holder. And then I'm going to drag box holder into here. And then press play. So what we've done is we've set up a trigger that says whenever we step into this trigger, turn off that box holder so as all those boxes fall. And you can see right now, they are still hovering there. That's all, not a problem. But as soon as we move closer, oh, there is one vital thing that Jimmy forgot to do. We didn't tick his trigger. So if you'd have done the exact same thing as what I did, you would have walked into that box, the imaginary box, because you can't see it, and it wouldn't have done anything because we need to tick his trigger. Classic. So just to kind of recap what's happened there is we've set everything up correctly except ticking his trigger because the box trigger object, this here, needs to know that it's a trigger. So that's why we have to tick his trigger there. So let's try that once again. We should be able to walk into this and they should collapse. So let's give that a go. And there we go. They fall on the floor. It's not grand, it's not amazing, but you've got to keep in mind that in order to do that, we use just a couple of lines of code. And if you do have problems with that script, I will put it in the pinned comment and in the description of the video so you can go and get it for free. But just to kind of prove that it wasn't a fluke, there's our boxes there, they're not doing anything. But then as soon as we get close, they do tumble. Like so. Like I say, it doesn't look very grand, but don't worry, this is early days of development. It takes a long time to make games look good. So next time what we're going to do is we're going to do a bit more environmental work. We're going to add in a door and then we're going to do some more coding to make it look as though we're trying to open the door. So do you remember that UI we did in the canvas? And the, was it last tutorial? We'll be interacting with that once again. So remember to subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with every tutorial in this series. And I will see you next time.